Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is the public forum for the Force 11 Working Group on the Researcher Bill of Rights and Principles. Um, um, my name is John Chidaki and um, I'm joined by Catherine Ancaro and Nate Jacobs, three of the, the leads of the working group. And we were um, intending this to just be a way for all, um, us to discuss the work that's been done by the working group and for us to walk you through our current draft uh, and gain some feedback. So for those that um, are not familiar with Force 11, um, it, we are a community organization. It's a nonprofit community run organization uh, that brings together people across the scholarly communications industry and communities and academia. Um, it includes researchers and scholars, as well as um, those that support research and scholarship, like librarians, archivists, publishers, and funders. Uh, Force 11 was founded in about 10 years ago uh, and has been uh, continuing to bring together working groups that discuss different topics that different challenges that uh, the scholarly communications community faces. Um, uh, as you know, um, as we all know, uh, there are many different things that are happening in our space that all revolve around open access and access to open science techniques and pushing towards a more open future for research. Um, there are a lot of terms, a lot of movements, a lot of people that are trying to achieve different goals, but many of them are focused in the same, same trajectory of trying to get towards a more open approach uh, to uh, handling uh, research, re the process of research and the dissemination of research findings. Um, Force 11 is interested in keeping this pathway moving and um, supporting different pathways towards a more open future. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to accomplish with this specific working group was trying to find a way to bring in the voices of researchers and scholars um, in this, this uh, wider movement that is occurring um, across the globe. And so what are some of the barriers? Why, why is something like this, what, this kind of discussion needed? Um, many times we have conversations about the future of research or about pathways to open access or to, to, uh, movements towards op open science. And we have those conversations in rooms where researchers are not there. Um, this has two, two sides to it. One is we're often having conversations that are not in, uh, informed by researcher concerns or, or priorities. But also many of the cutting edge or interesting uh, concepts that are coming up are being done in a way that doesn't involve researchers and therefore creates structural barriers for them to really engage. So some of these structures are really about um, the research communities themselves, the campus communities, um, the, the places researchers work are segmented. There are administrative units that handle certain aspects and then research units that, that have others as well. Many of the negotiations or discussions around openness um, and are about trying to move the industry towards a more open future are also seg segmented. Those negotiations are usually not handled by researchers themselves and many times don't include um, the ac academic uh, aspects of the campus. And this, these types of structural um, segmentations do many times create jargon and inside talk that create barriers themselves, just, just that the way that the movement is discussed. And so as open access and open science is evolving, many of that, the terminologies and the shorthands like you know, green OA, diamond OA, you know, gold OA, these, these things become um, shorthands that also create um, obstacles for researchers to get involved. And really it's a lot of the, the the barriers for researchers to really get involved in understanding what priorities should be discussed in, in, the, in this movement towards openness, um, it's because of time. Uh, researchers have full-time jobs. Um, and many of the reasons why these barriers exist is because um, of, of just time and resource constraints. And so this working group that we put together um, that we're here to discuss was really meant to describe uh, some of the basic fundamental rights and principles that uh, many researchers around the world who have jumped into these discussions um, to distill many of those down into something that could be found and reused and accessible to other researchers around the world. It's really tr intended to be a, a, a conversation where fundamental common 
principles and rights that have um, been discussed throughout the community um, could be clearly uh, written out and described so that future uh, research groups and researchers could reuse and repurpose them. Um, they are intended to be amended and customized. These are not intended to be um, applicable to every, every group, but really something to start researchers on their, their journey. And one disclaimer that we really wanted to make sure is that there is, there's no um, intended endorsement of any specific um, open access model or specific business model around how to move towards openness in any of these. It's really intended to be more universal than that from a researcher's perspective. What are the, the principles and rights that they, they would like to see happen as we move forward as a, a wider community? And so with that, I'll hand it off to Catherine to discuss our process. Thanks, John. Um, as we began this process, we recognized, um, much as there's been a lot of discussion, as John mentioned, there's a vast amount of, of rich content that's already been written that focuses on the broader issues in the transformation of scholarly communication and that are elemental to the pathways to open access, John mentioned. For this reason, we intentionally didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And so we began by assembling a set of source documents that included um, comprehensive statements and recommendations that have been put forth by such initiatives as Berlin Declaration, Budapest Open Access Initiative, DORA, Coalition S, Plan S, GRC Action Plan Toward Open Access, and a host of others that you can see on the screen. Sorry, that's, that print is so small. Um, then we also included published guidelines and principles designed to set standards for optimal open access practices, generally, as well as when negotiating with publishers, such as um, Lieber's Open Access Five Principles for Negotiations with Publishers and Swedish and Austrian National Guidelines for Open Access to Scientific uh, Information, among others, also listed in the list. And importantly, declared principles and values that were created and used in key instances within specific organizations and institutions that have successfully negotiated uh, these transformative publishing agreements with a wide range of academic publishers. Um, examples to which we turned include the University of California, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a host of national agreements that have followed the OA 2020 roadmap. Um, I do want to note um, that many more agreements have been forged between institutions and publishers um, successfully since we began our effort. Um, so those are not listed here necessarily, but we gathered those that were available at the time when we began our work. Um, as John said, when people use this list in the way that they, they feel is best for their particular situation, um, those additional agreements will of course play um, as great guidance and, and sources for further, uh, for further thought. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we next invited um, the leaders of the organizations and initiatives directly involved in the generation of many of these source documents um, to join our working group. This is just a small group um, pictured on the screen. There, uh, there are more, as I said, 31. Um, doing by inviting these particular individuals and other people involved in, in the transformation of uh, to open access um, ensured that both the process that we followed and the developed Bill of Rights that we intended to draft were true to the spirit and intention of the work that they had already done. Um, we were pleased to have favorable response from close to all um, we approached and we now have an engaged group of 31 who've contributed um, their expertise and insight as we've developed the current draft. Um, after reading through all the source documents, we began to distill the larger list to a set of five core statements that we felt best modeled the list of rights that we aim to draft. Um, these statements not only focus most directly on negotiations with publishers, but also best articulate the perspective of researchers specifically as those negotiations begin and proceed. Um, these include Amalika, Force 11 Scholarly Commons Principles, uh, the MIT, the University of California, and again, those following the OA 2020 roadmap. Um, uh, John, if you can return to the last slide, that'd be great. Um, not surprisingly, there was a lot of variety and what is included in these documents 
um, to be sure to capture all the comment, uh, the content that was unique and to consolidate where there was overlap. We grouped all the rights and principles for all of the core statements into broad content categories. Thanks, John. Next slide. And so um, taking each value of a principle from each of the core documents, we assigned one of 15 content categories. Um, they're listed here on the screen. I'll just read a couple of them. You can see they diverge from availability of research to stewardship. Um, transparent negotiations, public benefit, research assessment, um, human capital, in other words, the work that researchers do um, in, the, in the scholarly ecosystem, communications ecosystem, and uh, licensing and copyright, just to name a few. We then group the entire list of principles by these categories to begin to draft one or perhaps two rights that would best reflect that content category or perhaps more than one related content category. John, next slide, please. Um, this is a working version of the spreadsheet that we used to do just that, to draft the text from one or more rights per category. Um, this, we iterated on this repeatedly. This is one of the earlier versions. Um, we often um, did this iteration uh, guided by a return to the source documents list as well as really valued input from members of the working group. Uh, next slide, please. After several revisions based on working group input on a number of occasions, we now present the draft list of articles, uh, there are 10, and all are mapped to the 15 content categories um, for your community feedback. John, back to you. So thank you. Uh, so as we've stated, um, there were multiple iterations of the draft. Um, the current draft that we are here to present is what we're considering 1.0, um, and we're really looking for uh, feedback on them. Um, each individual, uh, what we're calling articles, um, have been loaded into a um, Google form, and I have just put the link in the chat. Um, Nate will be walking us through these principles one by one. And what we were looking for is feedback from the community on um, different aspects of them of, of, of each article. There is the the overarching um, feedback of whether or not the project of course is successful and what it's trying to achieve. But um, what you'll see in the Google form is um, when you first uh, go there will be a description of the preamble that we have written. Um, we won't be going through that today. Uh, if you want to click through that screen, um, it will then go through uh, article by article, asking questions around whether or not the article and the principle is is helpful and impactful, and whether or not it's well stated. Um, what uh, what we'll do is we will hopefully, um, while Nate is walking through each of the articles, we're hoping that you will be on your computer also walking through the Google form and giving feedback um, along the way. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Nate. All right. Yeah, so like John said, um, I'm just going to basically just read each article one by one and just you know give kind of a, a quick little take on it. Um, so um, the most important uh, feedback that you can give us is if you open up that Google form and um, are kind of clicking through and, um, you know, like John said, basically saying, is it go too far? Is it, um, 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 you know, need to be scaled back or is it just about right? Um, so, um, yeah, and so that link is down there at the bottom. It's in the chat, uh, tinyurl.com slash force 11 researcher. So I'll give you guys all just a second to kind of get that up and then we can go through them. Okay, so article one, researchers have the right to access scholarly works and all supplemental content and data immediately, freely, and openly. All scholarly work should be broadly and publicly disseminated. Uh, and basically the, you know, what we mean by this is, uh, you know, when an author publishes a scholarly work for the world to see, um, the world should be able to, to see and use that work. And I'll give you guys a second to sort of click through that Google form. And if, if anybody's having trouble with the Google form, um, you can post a little question in the chat. Um, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Okay. 
All right, should we go to the next one, John? Okay, Article 2. The right to access scholarly work includes the right to discovery, use, and machine readability of content and metadata without special licenses or restrictions immediately, freely, and openly. This requires adherence to best practices for open content as well as open metadata. And basically what, you know, what we mean by this one is that access to an article is not just being able to read it on a website, uh, but it's also making it machine readable so it can be accessible and usable in a variety of different uh, ways and infrastructures. And let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Um, are people able to um, keep up on the Google form? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think we're, we're doing ready for the next one. Okay, Article three, the right to access and use scholarly work extends to previously published content. Researchers should have the right to regain copyrights of previously published work. And for this one, you know, basically what this means and what we're, what we're getting at is, um, you know, it really speaks to, you know, quote unquote, lost literature uh, prior to embargoes and other OA policies. Uh, it means that authors, you know, really should have the right to ensure that their prior work um, is accessible and brought into the, you know, the, the modern kind of information age as well. And uh, it's going to take a bit of work to get there, but I think it's, it's an important one. Okay, Article 4. Future generations have the right to access published, published scholarly work and all supplemental content and data freely and openly. This requires long term preservation of scholarly content in libraries and other independent repositories and infrastructure, infrastructure entities to preserve all content freely and independently. And this one is basically all about preservation and safeguarding the larger you know, corpus of scientific literature for future generations. And I see a few questions popping up in the chat. Keep keep posting them there, and we'll um, we'll have some time at the after we go through the articles to to go through um, um, some questions and stuff at the end. So keep keep posting them, and we'll we'll get to them. Okay. Article five: Researchers have the right to use an open license by default, for example, CCBY or CC0, so that they can present, post, and share all of their scholarly work. This requires all publishers to offer open licensing at time of submission with no caveats or exemptions. And by this, what we're, what we're getting at is that, you know, if an author, if their intent um, is to broadly disseminate their work, um, you have to let them publish it CCBY, CCBY um, or equivalent so that they can do basic stuff like posting, sharing, and reusing their, their own work and author's work. And, um, really it's about matching the the author's intent um, and not sort of kind of tricking them or dissuading them um, into doing something that they're not trying intending to do by broadly disseminating their work okay article six Researchers have the right to deposit any version of their scholarly works into public or institutional repositories without legal or technical barriers. This right should apply at the time of submission with no caveats or exemptions. And this is essentially a backup option that ensures there's a safe copy in an institutional repository.
Okay, Article 7. Researchers have the right to freely and openly access metrics and other metadata that are essential to interpreting the impact and context of scholarly works. This requires that all citations, usage, and other content interaction metrics with content are made immediately, freely, and openly available. So this one, you know, kind of what we meant by this one is that interactions with articles such as citations and things like that are, you know, when you really think about it, they're, they're really an important and essential and integral part of the scientific literature. And so um, those also basically need to be open to really, you know, have that, that full scientific literature fully, fully open and usable. All right, Article 8. Contracts with publishers and other service providers should be fully transparent, free of any non disclosure agreements, and posted in public so they can be independently assessed by researchers and the general public. And this one is, is just to ensure transparency to help understand how you know, business models or different business decisions could uh, impact the broader enterprise of science. Okay, Article 9. Researchers have the right to disseminate their work without financial barriers, article processing charges and other publishing fees through established preferred dissemination channels for their community. This requires the establishment of equitable business models that prioritize reduction of financial hurdles based on researchers' contexts, ability to pay, uh, volunteer review editorial services, and, and things like that. Um, and Article 9 essentially just acknowledges that you know, increasing APCs are becoming you know, one of the biggest barriers to science. And you know, we just basically need to start thinking about that and, and start creating solutions to, to resolve that issue. Okay, last one, Article 10. Researchers, institutions, and libraries should prioritize relationships with academic publishers and other service providers that advance these basic rights. Researchers or libraries should never be required to waive any of these basic academic rights. And this one, this, you know, this final article is really just about um, you know, working with people who share your vision for a better future, um, you know, not those working against it. Um, you know, this is, this document and this working group and this process is as much about the direction we're headed um, as what we can achieve immediately today. Um, you know, no one is perfect. These issues are really hard, really complex and really challenging as anybody has uh, dived into this uh, knows, you know, well. Um, and, you know, basically life is short and, you know, work with people in orgs that share your values and, you know, just keep, Keep marching. <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess just to, to, to end with the feedback portion, um, you know, basically spread the word, um, 
we we have I think the, the Google form is really the main the main form of feedback that we'd like. So if, if um, anybody here knows of anybody that thinks that they would have feedback and you know you can post it on social or or you know email it out. Um, you know, basically we're trying to get as much much you know public feedback as we can. Um, and it really it really will make a, an impact and help us a lot. We'll be reading through the Google forms and, and anything that's kind of posted a message to us to, to kind of refine and synthesize and, and, and um, you know, tweak it as needed. Um, and uh, it looks like, oh yeah, so sorry, the, the date. So May 1st, we really like to try to get as much, uh, as much of that feedback in by May 1st so we can then incorporate it into the next document, uh, the next version then, and then can, can go from there. Great. Um... So that, thank you for the, the walkthrough. What we wanted to do now was to um, open it up for discussion, see if there were any comments or questions um, about the project or about the way the, the feedback is going. Um, we, uh, we will be sharing the slides afterwards um, and we are recording this uh, webinar for people to be able to view it. Um, between now and May 1st so that we can get additional feedback from the community. Um, we have had a couple comments come in, questions coming in through the chat. And so yeah, just, we could- Yeah, start picking those off. We could start taking those. Um, but maybe before we do that, I see uh, Roger, who's uh, been a member of the group. Do you wanna, do you have a sure, comment? Yeah, um, yeah, let me take a moment to say a couple of things. First of all, um, sure. so just to introduce myself to everybody since all this is very distributed and none of us are meeting in person anyway. So I'm, I'm faculty in, uh, at MIT and I'm the chair of the committee on the library system uh, there. And I'm very happy that we have pretty good representation uh, here right now from MIT. So Catherine Dunn, who's a, a amazing firebrand uh, leader in open access at MIT libraries and um, Abe Leviton, who's a fellow member of the committee on the library system are both here. And um, I also want to say it's, I'm delighted that the MIT framework for publisher contracts is one of the, we worked very hard on that and we feel like it's been very helpful. It's very helpful, helpful to us to see those, um, to see those, uh, the impact that it's having. Um, and I think that should be encouraging to everybody who's doing these things that, you know, when you create a new statement of principles, you're not necessarily shouting into a void. It really does have impact. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that this, uh, set of um, this bill of rights and principles will also have a similar kind of impact. I, I wanted to just share, um, just for context, because we've been doing a lot of work in the past, very recently, really, um, at MIT. And I just want to share with everybody a little bit about what we've been doing just to give context. And also, um, it, it may be relevant for this discussion, which is that um, uh, building on the MIT framework for publisher contracts, over the last several months, we've been working on um, so the Open Access Task Force at MIT in 2019 issued a set of recommendations that included um, our committee together with the Faculty Policy Committee at MIT, which is the highest level faculty governance committee, to ratify a set of, uh, a a set of principles around open scholarship. And um, we've been working a lot on that recently, and it's, quite, it's, it's shaping up very nicely. And um, it's, it's, a, it's been formulated into a set of principles on open, open and equitable scholarship. And we're also trying to make sure that it's aligned uh, effectively with this, with the Force 11 um, uh, bill, Bill of Rights and Principles. And um, I'm really delighted. To, I think there's very, the things that have come up as prominent in our conversations, I think are very clearly manifested here. One thing that I wanna emphasize is that, um, that increasingly as we have discussed uh, in our own uh, in discussions with our own committee and other stakeholders at MIT, the issue of equitable opportunity to participate has is really coming to the fore. And I think you can sort of also see this in terms of where the changes in the landscape of uh, you know um, of where uh, negotiations and deals between publishers and libraries have been going. So, for example, Elsevier's recent deal with the University of California with uh, Springer Nature's deal. Uh, things that are happening in Europe. And I think that where we're headed, in a sense, there's been this very meaningful progress of uh, uh, very meaningful progress around um, moving away from the script subscription model. So huge progress in that. But in some sense, there, there are new risks that, uh, that arise. We're moving in a sense to the next stage of what do we have? What are the things that come to the fore? 
And one of those is, uh, you know, is equitable access to participate. So if you sort of imagine rolling forward, you know, read and publish agreements and everybody's got those now, you've got the scholars who don't have the right institutional affiliation and who aren't wealthy uh, left out in the cold. And so the issue of equity is coming becoming more and more prominent for us. And I think it's very nicely addressed um, in, I think it's Article 9. Uh, in, and in particular, the, I think the language around um, preferred established preferred venues as a, like a right to actually disseminate one's research there, I think is, is very, very powerful and valuable. And so I really, really think that's great. Um, but I, I, I would just sort of further say that um, I think actually sort of thoroughly embedding this issue of equitable opportunity to participate is, is, is really, really important. I, I would say even very within the last month or so, I think it's become clear to us um, uh, how, just how important it is at this stage. And, and so I wanna transmit that feedback on where we are and sort of our perspective on something that we're building up in the future. And I, I hope we'll be soon at a stage that we can, we're still, we still are doing something, you know, it's an internal process, but hopefully we'll be able to share it a little more widely soon um, to get broader feedback as well. But we're working hard, we're really quite cognizant of uh, what Force 11 is doing here and um, trying to align with that. Thanks. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this this does also touches a lot on some of the questions that are coming up around um, what is the point of these these the, this list and what and how do we expect it to be used? Mm -hmm. um, and this is um, it's really around this idea that um, there are um, conversations going on on campuses and in communities around the world. Um, many times they are happening in ways that. Um, are, are, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that are segmented from researchers. And very often researchers are feel like they um, do not have a voice or have a way of describing their, their priorities to, it, to the people involved in those negotiations or those discussions. Um, these, these, this list here is intended to be somewhat of a, a boilerplate, um, a way for helping research groups um, have a grounding to start those, those a way for them to articulate um, values and principles that they want to, um, to their own campus or local community. It's not intended to be in a, like a, 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 a statement, a, a set that would fit in all contexts. Um, it's definitely, um, as we move forward, we plan to build out additional um, toolkits and descriptions around what is meant by each of these to really give more context and fully flesh out for researchers who are doing, investigating these, these types of issues to understand what might be applicable to them and what might not be. Um, but also, um, you know, as Roger was saying, often if you are in a very privileged scenario, Equity is not necessarily top of mind when you think about your own relationship to access to information or the future of scholarship. And so it's also educating researchers on the complexity of the situation that they're in. And so there, I think there was a comment in the, in the chat about, you know, why uh, this does still sound very skull comsy. It's not um, in a researcher voice. Um, and that is true. Um, it is something that we want to definitely flesh out in, in the FAQ and the guidance around these that we, um, as we move forward, building out a toolkit. Um, but it's really intended to be somewhat of a bridge. Um, we're trying to give researchers a set of principles or rights that they can, can use and repurpose on their own, but a bridge to, to, the, to the, the subject area and to the community. And it is very informed by the, the work that was done at MIT and at the University of California and other universities that um, where researchers did um, come together and build um, um, similar um, principles. And, you know, obviously Catherine went through all of the source documents that we relied on very heavily. Um, okay, uh, we have several other comments that are coming in. Um, and I guess just to add one quick thing to what you're just saying, John, um, if, Anybody here or anybody comes into contact with somebody who's sort of at that period where uh, position where they would want to do something like this at their university, but they don't have maybe the infrastructure or the team that MIT has or the UC has. That's like a really great use case for this, where we can help connect uh, people with those those other teams and use the, the Bill of Rights and, and other supportive um, um, things that we can do to basically help make that happen in context where it wouldn't then you basically need a little bit of activation energy to, to get that going. Um, so that that'd be something to, to watch out for and let us know about. R Roger, awesome. raise your hand again. Uh, oh, go ahead, Catherine. 
No, I was just going to say that, you know, just, I'm sorry, Roger, just a quick point that much as, as Nate said too, this is intended to be along the journey. And much as you said, Roger, you know, we, we solve one problem and, and there are others that we become aware of. And so that's going to be the same with this list of rights. You know, we, we iterated on this countless times. And yes, it's foundational, but it too will evolve over time. And I think that's the important part is that serving, serving this as a baseline, but already equity has been raised and rightly so at this point. And there's some other excellent points that we will take from the feedback that we receive both today and onward and through the Google form. And, you know, we may, you know, decide that we need 15 articles. I mean, you know, 10 isn't a magic number, but we just thought that these would be the baseline to start. So again, emphasis on this is a draft. So over to you, Roger. I just want to briefly build on something. I think it, I was it maybe Nate who said it um, or John that. So one thing we've actually discussed, and I'd love to hear people's feedback about this in our committee on the library system at MIT, is the question of how do we actually lower the activation energy for so we you know University of California, MIT, and a few other places have I think just sort of had the right people in the right place, and also the sort of institutional agility and orientation. To, um, to sort of get good, uh, get a critical mass of sort of researcher and, and not, not just researcher, you know, throughout all start parts of the institution, the right people in the administration and the libraries, the researchers, the students and staff and postdocs. And we're actually thinking now about how do we lower the activation energy for that? So University of California has done very effective things in terms of putting together toolkits for negotiations with scholarly publishers, but there's another piece, which is sort of like activating communities. And um, I'd love if there's, if that seems like something that would be useful to bring into the conversation. I hadn't come into this meeting thinking about that, but that is something we were talking about. And we could imagine like putting together a collaborative sort of toolkit and set of recommendations a lot, uh, on that topic as well. I just want to bring that up. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, we, we have relied a lot on the work that um, you have done, but also um, Rich Schneider at the University of California has really done a lot of work on activating yes. Yes. activating the, um, the research community across campuses. And I think that that is, would be a, a very helpful and informative toolkit for research communities going forward. Um, yeah, yeah, we've learned a lot from Rich, believe me. <laughs> Um, one, one thing that's coming up in the chat that I think is interesting is this um, mapping these types of um, principle statements to broader um, UNESCO recommendations and the UN Declaration of Human Rights and really thinking about how to, to both map the guarantees and the, the, the opinions that are within these rights, but also to map them to you know, social justice or, or human rights types of statements that exist out in the, the broader context as well. Um, could be very, very helpful for um, trying to showcase why they are important. Um, and that is something that also came up, which is, uh, it looks like in the chat, the question of you know, why, why would researchers take the time to even engage in this? Um, <laughs> And I think that that is, um, it is a great question and one that I think also has a lot to do with just the, the, the time that we live in now, even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there was not the same amount of um, energy and discussion happening around researchers for them to you know, start to feel like they should get involved. Um, many of it comes to the groundswell from research communities themselves, researchers themselves, as Roger was mentioning, you know, researchers themselves getting um, agitated or excited or energized by certain aspects of the, the process. But it's also about the fact that there's just a lot of change happening in scholarly communications. And so this creates this, this, this point of, in our history where there are a lot more people who need to be educated and, and to, be, to be part of this discussion. And so I think that the real, the real reason for having this type of um, project now is so that researchers have that kind of a toolkit or resource for them to, to jump into something that they maybe hadn't thought about um, previously. John, there's um, a notation of, of a couple of comments that, we, um, that are, are earlier in the chat and uh, we've been wisely said, let's not forget. And that basically is how do, how do we anticipate that these, these, this Bill of Rights will be used? Um, you know, 
will it be used by libraries or publishers or academic departments to adopt these? Um, I would say all of the above. I think the intention is that this would be across different departments, across different use cases. Again, they would be modified or whatever, um, depending, or they could be, say, for example, from a consultation basis, here's a list for you to think about. Um, you know, it, it is meant to be widely um, circulated and available to researchers, to librarians, to academic departments, to negotiating teams. I think that's important too. I mean, much to the effect that researchers are busy and yet if they have a collective statement and, you know, like you're saying, Roger, and that Rich has done at UC, if you know that there's a campus-wide support for that, that can, that can have a lot of powerful effect in all of those different scenarios. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. And so I'm going to say all of you both. Yeah, and I, I would just say one, one question, one uh, little story there is that in preparation for this webinar, um, we were doing outreach around this webinar and an active researcher from a very privileged university, you know, reached out to us saying, thank you for doing this because I feel that researchers are not really involved in the discussions that are going on on my campus. And it does help us or, like think about how we can articulate um, and organize on our campus. And so I think that that in itself is kind of what we're, we're hoping to, to, to achieve is just creating a a place or a space or, or some item out in the in the Skullcom's world that can become a, a point of for for re reflection and then action on the on the on behalf of researchers themselves. Um, and then just to take that even a little bit further, um, I think that the yeah I think that the, the initial sort of uh, idea is to to focus on researchers, but I do feel like. Uh, as you kind of tweak and fork and like kind of like it can be used in different situations. I think it could get even broader than that. So, um, you know, I was a researcher for a long time, but I'm also now more on in the kind of publisher platform space. And so I could see me actually um, tweaking this and kind of like refining it for a specific use case with like how uh, more from the, the platform perspective, like how we should behave to, to adhere to these articles. And so I think there's a lot of different, and that's, that's kind of taking it in a little bit different direction, but I think that it's sort of a, the idea is that it can be forked and spread and as things evolve, um, it can be used in different use cases and, and applied and refined in different, in different ways. When I would love to, to um, assess the interest of the community in terms of once they've been used in a particular situation to share that. Uh, yeah. Because I think oftentimes you don't realize, oh, I never even thought that that would be helpful in that situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why we have to keep, you know, this is why Force 11 is a great group because this, this discussion should continue. And if the whole, you know, pathway is changing and all of the issues along with it. But once we've established these rights connected to larger sets of rights, I think they have, um, they have a long, uh, they have a, a potential for a long lasting effect. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I think we have about uh, three more minutes. I don't know if, um, if there's any additional comments or questions that we're seeing that we should make sure we tackle. John, can we make sure that we, this is a technical, can we, can we make sure that we copy all of the, the, the chat so we don't lose all Absolutely. of those comments and stuff? <laughs> yes. And so if we, didn't, if we didn't get to something, we'll, we'll make sure to read through and, and you know, reach out. Yeah, we appreciate that the chat is going to be very helpful. We do want to try to capture as much feedback as possible in the Google form, but yeah. this kind of conversational chat is actually helpful as well. So when the working group gets back together to distill, we can use it a, a lot more on um, like the, the framing of the, the, the future of the project. And we do have a deadline of May 1st for the, for the comments in this particular round. But as I've said, and we, we um, articulated here, this is a draft and there will be a subsequent draft. And so there will be an opportunity to review that later. But right now, this, um, the comments that we received by May 1st are, are really um, essential and very valued. So please do share this, uh, this link with as many people that you feel would be interested in participating. Yeah, and I, I do think we, we want to end by saying thank you for everybody that came today, but also, um, you know, and to Force 11 and to the community, but also we are um, building this work off of the work of others. So this is a, a, also a thank you to 
um, those like Roger and MIT and Rich Schneider and University of California and, and Plan S and all the source documents that we we put to, we put uh, Dora and the Budapest principles. I mean these these are foundational um, conversations and very often, including Force Eleven, they were started by researchers. Um, while we in the Skullcoms world or library world might refer to them as very very much like inside uh, talk. They are very, most of the foundational work that we rely on comes from researchers. And so we want to find the way to distill these into a, a new source document that can help additional resource or researchers to come into the discussion. So thank you to everybody who um, had just been working on this for, for many years. And thank you for joining us today for the webinar.